furthering our lives. We thank Thee for the instructors that we have had here for the administration of this institution. We ask Thee that a blessing be with those that are participating on the program and with all those that are graduating. And we thank Thee for our talents and for all that we hope to do and seek in our lives. And we ask Thee again to bless each of us as we strive to increase our knowledge in our various schools and interests of learning. And we say these things in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. It is certainly my pleasure to welcome you here this evening for this commencement program, to welcome all of you, students, and their families, faculty, guests, all who are here this evening. I would like first to introduce the platform guests and as I introduce them, I'll ask them if they will stand briefly. Then, if you will hold your applause until all of them have been introduced, please. Dr. Max Lowe, Vice President for Instruction. Dr. Charles Digert, guest speaker. Mr. John Class, Chairman of the Institutional Council. Mr. George Hatch, Award Recipient. Mrs. Jeanette Kendrick, Institutional Council Member, and Mrs. Sue Marie Young, Award Recipient. Mr. Burton Talmage, Vice President for Development. Mr. James Snurl, Vice President for Business Affairs. Mr. Glenn Riddle, Student Body President. Jane Wiggins, Program Participant. David Austin, program participant. Linda Cordova, program participant. Linda Strasberg, program participant. And Loretta Walker, program participant. Judd Morgan, Dean of Students. Dr. Arvo Van Alstein, Commissioner of Higher Education. Ms. Reba Keel, member of State Board of Regents. Mrs. Elva Barnes, member of State Board of Regents. Dr. Richard Maxfield, member of the State Board of Vocational Education. Mr. Gerald Condor, Vice Chairman of the Institutional Council. Mr. Harry Blundell, Institutional Council member. Mrs. Louise Henson. Institutional Council Member, Mr. Mose Watkins, Institutional Council Member, Ms. Ingrid Sands, Institutional Council Member, Dr. Michael Homer, Dean of the School of Business, Mr. Jeff Brueger, Dean of the School of Continuing Education, Mrs. Ann Erickson, Dean of the School of Technology and General Education, Mr. Walter White, Dean of the School of Trades and Industry. And Mrs. Lou Ann Poulsen, Associate Director, Scale Center. Give him a hand of applause, please. As I stand here before another graduating class from Utah Technical College, I'm once again impressed with the college. You graduates are the greatest proof of how well the college is doing in its efforts to provide a quality education to students and also meet the educational training needs of the state of Utah. 
This has been a good year in many respects for Utah Technical College. And as I look down the commencement program, I'm reminded that, it, that one reason for our success is the support we receive from people such as those receiving Distinguished Service Awards this evening. Another major reason why the college is successful is the number of outstanding faculty and staff that have been attracted to the college and the excellent job they do day after day, year after year. Recently, we had a recognition evening for faculty and staff. I was especially impressed by the total amount of service to the college by those being honored, which was in excess of 2,100 years. One sure measure of commitment to the college is how long people stay employed there. The main reason why that amount of service is so impressive is the high quality of that service. We're here tonight to honor you students for your accomplishments, and appropriately so. The college has had some outstanding graduating classes, but I'm told that this has to be the finest class that we've graduated from the college. At a recent student awards program, the list of students from your graduating class being recognized for scholastic achievement, for excelling in student activities, and for other achievements was long and impressive. We do recognize you and honor you for what you've accomplished as students at Utah Technical College at Salt Lake. We welcome all of the family and friends of those graduating, graduating here this evening and applaud you for the assistance you've given to members of this class that has helped them in completing the requirements for graduation. When you students leave this commencement this evening, you will be alumni of the college. If you have not yet been contacted by the college alumni council, you will be soon. The college wishes to maintain contact with you. Your support and feedback is a major way the college has of assessing how well we're doing in meeting the needs of students and of the community. So we want to keep you informed about the college and have you keep us informed about the community. Understanding of the role of Utah Technical College is increasing in our community. Because of that understanding, more students are applying for entrance. Due to financial limitations and resultant space limitations, we have been forced to turn students away from some popular classes in the past year. Every effort is being made to eliminate such limits and provide an education to all who wish to come to the college. Let me give you a little information that you undoubtedly know, but impresses me. Fall quarter, we had approximately 9,000 students at the college. Enrollments for each of the ensuing quarters exceeded previous years also. Much of that growth is in continuing education. With continued rapid growth in continuing education and in our co-op education program, which takes credit earning students into business and industry as a part of their coursework, we can still expand beyond existing space limitations. The average age of UTC students is almost 30 years. Women between the ages of 30 and 50 constitute the segment of student body that is increasing the fastest. A very high percentage of students continue to enroll in the vocational and technical programs of the college. But business and industry are asking for employees with more basic communication skills and general education. Our new Associate of Science program is also growing rapidly, and some of you here are graduating this evening from that program. Now let me mention just a few of the changes and accomplishments at the college this last year, and perhaps a few projections. A new location was purchased for the downtown campus of the college. The Skill Center is already in the process of preparing for the move, which we hope will be accomplished within the next year. We created an assessment center to better assist students through testing and counseling, and it's proving to be a huge success. 
This is the year that the placement center really came into its own, providing a significant amount of increased assistance to those looking for jobs and those wanting to hire. The number of job openings as well as the number of people placed in jobs has increased approximately 275 percent over just one year earlier. We now have a full-fledged alumni council, which held its first phonathon to recontact college alumni and also to raise money for scholarships. And it was a resounding success. A new business building is under construction and will provide acutely needed additional classrooms. For your information, when we fill that new business building, we will still have more business classes than can be moved into it. By fall quarter, we will have some relief from the difficult parking problems at the college. <laughs> the new Copper Room Saturday Night Buffet became so popular this year that in spite of all the expanding we were able to do, we could not accommodate all of the people if they had not made advanced reservations. Student Services has completed plans for telephone registration, which will begin this coming year. We thought it was a big step just two years ago when we started mail-in registration. The College Foundation launched its first campaign to attract private funding support for the college, with some significant successes. There were other successes, which I'll not take the time now to enumerate. As we look forward to the future, we're planning to teach classes in locations all around the valley, rather than wait until we have new facilities built on campus. The college has increased productivity by about 25% in the past five years, and financial pressures are insisting that we increase productivity even more. The greatest challenge to the college in the immediate future is the ability to expand fast enough to accommodate the increasing number of students wanting to come to the college and at the same time maintain the quality education for which we have developed such a reputation. This has been a good year for the college. I know it will be a good year for you graduates because of the opportunities available to graduates in the fields you have chosen. Keep in touch. We desire to continue providing assistance to you in all ways that we can. Just remember that this is not an ending, but is a commencement, as the title of these proceedings suggests. Thank you. Push that back down. This is the no, up and down. Okay. Uh, I knew this was a political year, but uh, I didn't realize that President Carnahan was a candidate for any office until he made that remark about parking. And uh, I deduce now that he could be the successful nominee at either the Republican or the Democratic Convention for governor if he goes around talking like that very often. Uh, before I ask my longtime acquaintance and friend, Mr. George C. Hatch, who's a recipient of the Distinguished Service Award of the college, to step forward, I have a few very brief preliminary remarks that I want to make. First of all, I would like to correct an egregious error uh, that appears in your uh, commencement program in which it alludes to the fact that Mr. Hatch was the part chairman of the uh, uh, Utah Board of Regents. Now anybody that's ever known George Hatch knows that he's not part anything. He's wholly immersed in whatever he does, and so we'll just have to castigate the printer for that, for that error. If I were, uh, as chairman of the Institutional Council, and speaking on behalf of the Institutional Council, to try to recite all of the multitudinous uh, business and industrial achievements uh, that uh, our award winner, Mr. Hatch, has uh, secured and attained within his uh, field of electronic and uh, printed media, we'd have to ask Dr. Dr. Tiger to cut his remarks substantially short. So I'm not going to do that, but I am going to discuss very briefly two aspects of uh, the personality and character of George Hatch that aren't widely known. First of all, he's an ardent and wholly supportive conservationist in the finest sense of the word. For many, many years, 
he and his wife, Jean, have been involved in such activities as helping to create the Canyonlands National Park, uh, as uh, getting the Arches National Monument and the Capitol Reef National Monument designated national parks, <coughs> excuse me, and, and securing extension of additional park lands to the Capitol Reef National Monument, a national park. And then later, he has exhibited a vast amount of successful activity on behalf of the Utah State Park System. Another facet of George Hatch's personality is that he personifies the concept that the great uh, public-spirited citizen Robert Hinckley had when he established the Hinckley Institute of Politics, and which I think is essential to the preservation of democracy in our country, and that is citizen involvement in politics. And George Hatch has been involved as a citizen in the most constructive way that anyone can be. And I think that this is an attribute uh, that more of us need to follow. Now, now, George, if you'd please come forward, I'd like to read this proclamation and, award it, and give this award to you. This Distinguished Service Award is presented to George C. Hatch, having distinguished himself as an influential businessman in the field of electronic and printed communication, and having served honorably as a member of the Utah State Board of Regents, and subsequently as chairman of that governing body for higher education in this state, and having been a willing advocate for the cause of educational technical education, Vocational, uh, vocational technical education, and having prepared himself for his professional career by graduating with a Bachelor of Arts degree and a Master's degree in Economics from Claremont College in Pomona, California, and having rendered substantial service to many civic and cultural organizations, and having accepted the responsibility as a member of the Board of Directors of Utah Technical College Foundation. Now, there, therefore, this citation is awarded as an expression of the respect held by the administration, faculty, students, and staff of Utah Technical College to George C. Hatch, presented this day, June 7, 1984. Congratulations, George. Thank you very much, John, for those flattering remarks and for the Distinguished Service Award. <clears throat> In the years I was served on the Board of Regents, one of my greatest pleasures was to award diplomas at this school's graduations because the school has accomplished uh, what I long sought, and that is that our schools graduate students that have an employable skill. As an employer, it was extremely distressing to me over many years to interview college graduates who came in for a job and who had no skill to offer that enabled them to get a challenging or worthwhile job. Today, I congratulate you on graduating from a school that does provide you with those skills and it will contribute throughout your life to your pleasure. Uh, that's the good news. The bad news is that our average employee finds that three times during their career they have to go back to school and take some more courses in order to keep up with changes in their occupation. So relax and enjoy yourself tonight. By the time you have to come back, you'll enjoy it again. Thank you very much. so nice at this particular time for you're excited about graduating, you're thinking, I wish everyone would get through so that I can get mine over and we can go out. But one thing will come back to you over the years are people that you have met tonight that will lead you on and you'll turn back and think, I've met that person, they were shining light and they were guidance. Tonight Utah Technical College is presenting this Distinguished Service Award to Sue Marie Young. The words distinguished and award are very gratifying and are deserved recognition in our community. However, the word that most aptly describes this outstanding person is the word service. Everyone contributes to this old world, but few serve with love, compassion, and dedication. And regardless of monetary rewards or community recognition, this is what Mrs. Young has done. The love of people 
has been the reason for her contributing to the vocational education. Professionally trained students to match versatility in, in job forces. Compassion for the environmental surroundings that are important to her by being aware and fairness to others that led her to work with utilities and water districts and the advisory committee for safe drinking water. All this leads to dedication to a better way of life, not just for herself and not just for her family and not for the city of Richfield, but for all of humanity. Mrs. Young, this world owes you a sincere thank you for your service and for your dedication. Sue Marie Young, would you please join me for the service award? Having served as chairperson of the Utah State Advisory Council on Vocational Education and having pr promoted the cause of vocational technical education throughout the state, and having been president and the dynamic force of Lay's Rock Products, a general contractor known and widely respected in the field, and having prepared herself for a practical career by gaining the Bachelor of Science degree from Brigham Young University, and having involved herself in a major state and local educational, government, governmental, and political issues, and having furthered the professional role of women by being mayor of Richfield, the first woman in the city history to be elected to public office. Now therefore, this citation is awarded to Sue Marie Young as an expression of the respect held for her by the administration, the faculty, the students, and the staff of the Utah Technical College. Presented June the 7th, 1984. Thank you, Mrs. Kendrick, President Carnahan, Board of Regents, members of the Institutional Council, faculty and graduating student body tonight. I think tonight can be put in proper perspective by reciting a story that took place many centuries ago. Socrates was interviewing some prospective students and he asked them, can you cook your own meals? No, said the student, we have servants to do that. Can you make your own sandals? No, said the students, we have servants to make our sandals. What about your toga? No, we also have servants to make our togas. Socrates lowered his head and said, Isn't it a shame that we train our servants better than we train our own children? Tonight, graduating class, I salute you for being the wisest of the Greeks. Cherish and revere your fine vocational heritage and education that this outstanding institution has given to you. I want to tell you, President Carnahan and faculty and students, that I am truly and humbly honored by this Distinguished Service Award. Thank you very much. President Carnahan, <clears throat> honored guests, faculty, friends, fellow graduates, we brought our hopes and aspirations to Utah Technical College a few years ago. Now our hopes and aspirations are about to become realities. Although we honor each other as graduates and show our family and friends that we have accomplished a difficult task, most of all we have come to this commencement exercise to express our thanks and appreciation to the instructors of Utah Technical College, for our graduation is as much a representation of their success as it is our own. In a few short years, our family and friends will be hard pressed to remember this moment in our personal histories. Yet in the same few years, we will be receiving honors and praise for our own accomplishments at that time we need to remember that the honors we receive belong to those who taught us as much as it does to ourselves. That is why this commencement exercise is our opportunity to give our thanks to the faculty of Utah Technical College. I was recently told of a woman who brought her hopes to the college. This woman was recently divorced. Her ex-husband obtained everything in the divorce proceedings except their home. She was left with a house without any furniture 
except for a sleeping bag and a Coleman lantern. Devastated, she wanted to die, but she failed at suicide twice. Somehow she turned to the future, and she began attending Utah Technical College. Her first midterm test, and she received a C grade. She felt that she had failed, and she went to a student counselor for advice. After hearing her story, he praised her for being such a tremendous success, for this woman was holding a full-time job, a part-time job out of necessity. She has kept her home and was refurnishing it a little at a time. And on top of this, she is attending college, studying business law at night. Indeed, this woman, like many other people, are fantastic examples of success. For out of disasters, they reach out and find a second opportunity to obtain their dreams. Salt Lake City is very fortunate to have Utah Technical College, a place where second opportunities still abound. We will leave this commencement exercise with a piece of paper that will attest to our accomplishments at UTC. But this is not all, for we will also take with us friends and memories Years from now, we will be able to weigh the cost of our new skills against our future social and financial status, and this will give us a vague idea of the value of our education. But there is no means to measure the value of our friendships. Leonard Wright once wrote in retrospect, as old wood is best to burn, old horses to ride, old books to read, and old wine to drink, so are old friends most trusty to use. Now we are new friends, but soon time will have worked its magic and we shall be old friends. Then the cost of our education will be far outweighed by the value of our friendships. A graphic design instructor told me about one of the many friends that he has made at Utah Technical College. Carol graduated from the college eight years ago and is now working for the United States government as an illustrator. She lives in New York, on Long Island, and owns her own home. Recently, Carol returned to Salt Lake City to visit old friends. While she was here, she told one of her former instructors, I am using what I learned at UTC, making a ton of money and having a ball doing it. Utah Technical College has given each of us a secure footing in the vocations we have chosen. With this fine beginning, let us continue to look to the future and achieve many successes. Yet, may we always remember with fondness Utah Technical College, where our dreams began to materialize. Thank you. Our commencement speaker, Dr. Charles Digert, began his career in industry as a tool and die maker for General Motors while earning a bachelor's degree at Ohio State University. He later earned his master's and doctor's degree in industrial education. His graduate activities were directed towards self-concept studies including management and leadership skills. As State Association Director of a National Educational Leadership Organization, Dr. Digert was able to rally the necessary leadership team to develop an organization of over 40,000 state members, the largest in the nation. Working with Ohio's governor in the Ohio Department of Development, Dr. Digert assisted in the initiation of Ohio's educational linkage with economic development in Ohio. Now President of Motivational Enterprises International Incorporated of Columbus, Ohio, Dr. Digert has also served on the faculty of Ohio State University for the past 16 years. Dr. Digert has spoken to over 2,000 groups in all 50 states, Canada, Europe, and Japan during the past 15 years. Dr. Digert.
Thank you very much. It is indeed a pleasure for me to be in Utah, and my congratulations to President Carnahan, distinguished guests, award recipients, parents and friends of graduates, and of course graduates. I would like to direct my remarks to the graduates, but maybe first to the people who are here to see them graduate. Research has suggested that probably one of the most greatest things to happen, one of the most exciting things to happen, is to have someone recognize we for our talent. The great emotional edge in life is having someone say to you, you are superb, you're special, you're doing well. But there's one thing that's even higher than that. The greatest thrill one can receive in life is seeing someone you care for arrive at some achievement level. And the graduates may not know, but the parents and the people here, that are here this evening to see them graduate are feeling and sharing, and almost to the point of tears, the pride they have for the graduates here receiving their associate's degree this evening. And I feel very good about that, and I, I think you parents and friends of the graduates should know it is an important evening for you also. I think I'd like to share with you and speak directly to the graduates as to what perhaps I see you might be looking towards as you leave your technical background, your skills, and take them to the business community. I work directly in the state of Ohio and across this nation with the business community. It is my responsibility to provide ec economic development resources from the educational community to assist in sound economic development in our state and, of course, throughout the nation working with other state agencies. I've discovered a lot of things. I found out that in the business community, what you might expect to find three or four or five years ago will be different. It's a brand new arena of work in the business community. I used to be a tool and die maker. I was a tool and die maker for 13 years. And I think you folks in this audience need to know as I work with the business community, it is not my doctorate or PhD that causes me the entry and have the reputation to be able to speak with the business community. Once they find out that I used to work in industry as a tool and die maker, those are the credentials that appear to be important. They care not about my degrees. They want to know my practical background and application. I think that's important because you folks who are graduating here tonight are taking saleable skills into the business community that are considered important by the business community. The business community of today and the emerging business community, if you have not read a book called In Search of Excellence, I'd recommend that you graduates take time to go to the library and pick up a copy of In Search for Excellence. Chapter 3, called Man Searching for Motivation, clearly states what the business community and the direction the business community is going. We're moving from what we used to call a rational model to something called an intuitive model. It simply means that the managers and the management styles of the future are right brain oriented, which simply means that's intuitive. It simply means environmental. It simply means working is not enough. That working in a working environment simply means that that environment offers me something also. The environment in which you work is exceedingly and extremely important. Working directly with industry in our state and working with 275 major firms, each of those firms are moving into what we call environmental transitions. They're trying to make work environments fun places to be. They're trying to make working environments more healthy for people. We're finding out that working environments in themselves can generate, if they are negative, something called psychosomatic illness. We're finding out the stress generated in working environments is not from the working environment itself. It's not from the work, I should say. It's from the working environment. It's from our relations with people. And I think you should know, and I'm going to share research with you that I'm sure you do not have access to because the research was just released last month. The research clearly says what the future working environment in America will be like. The research suggests, the research suggests that in a working environment, that is supposed to add to our psychological concept of self. Working in a working environment, when we go there day in and day out, we are supposed to come away from that working environment feeling good about us. And the researchers are suggesting they have a pretty good handle. They have a pretty good handle on what really is supposed to happen. There's research, and it's called brain-mind research. And the research suggests, and for you parents and husbands and wives and people who love one another, I think this is particularly important. The research they are looking at, they have mapped the brain. And they have mapped an area of the brain called the emotional center. The emotional center of the brain has found to be very, very rich in something called opiate receptors. Opiate receptors receive a chemical naturally generated by the brain that calms you down, makes you feel at peace, makes you feel at ease. And what they found out when a child, a small child, is held by its mother, when the child is taken away from its mother, the child will cry. And they're finding out the reason being because when you're drawn away or away from the environment of someone you love, 
opiates in your brain cavity quit being produced. In other words, it's a mildly stressful environment. When the child is placed back with the mother, we find that the opiates begin uh, being generated again and you find you're at rest. We thought, isn't that amazing, mother-to-child relationship? What they're also finding, however, that that same stimulus occurs in husband and wife relationships. When a man and woman get married and conceive a marriage relationship, the same thing happens, and many of you experience this. You've left home on a trip, and I do it every time I leave home. When I leave home, I feel sad for some reason. I have a one, it's called the fear of depression or the depression of separation. That's what it's called. It simply means that that person gives you such peace that you feel safe around them. And the most startling facts we have found that that is true in social and or working environments. Wouldn't it be wonderful that everybody you worked with in the working environment, as you attended your working environment, that the peace level there was so good that those folks caused you a peace where your opiates developed the normal petition level of opiates so you were at peace in your working environment. What we're finding out, the new environmental conditioning that America's interested in, and these are deliberate management procedures, these are not casual, that they are looking towards making environments of work more palatable. And I work, as I mentioned, directly with 275 firms. All 275 firms are actively engaged in employing something called employee participant groups, quality of work life, and all of those things really mean they're trying to make the working environment more palatable, which means that each of you graduates in this room have something to do. It is your role, your job, your responsibility with the skills you have moving into the technical environments in which you will work. It is your responsibility to become inspired with you. It is your job each day to look in the mirror and become flat out inspired by what you see. It is your job to look in that mirror and get excited with yourself because then you can carry that attitude to the working environment and cause that working environment to evolve in the evolution that we feel that American industry is moving. And that's not a casual statement. In Search of Excellence, if you'd like to read chapter three, it's full of that kind of information. We're trying to make the American working environment. And believe it or not, this is all so true in the medical profession. And I worked with the medical profession in doing seminars and lecture series for them. We're finding out that a physician just giving you a pill is not enough. That now the physician must give you a pill and love along with it, assuring you that you probably would get well. They're saying that the medicine is only half of the treatment. The other half is a physician assuring you, because going back to that opiate development, they find out that the physician makes you feel well with yourself psychologically. Your chances of getting well are excellent. So it's across all professions, not just manufacturing. And I suppose the best way to describe that is a phenomenon I witnessed when I was in Japan. I visited Japan last August as part of a team of experts from the state of Ohio. In other words, what the team was, we were putting into the state of Ohio something called continuous caster steel making in a place called Wheeling Pittsburgh Steel Area. I don't know if you know that area, but it's very depressed. They put in a brand new steel making machine, the technology of which came from Japan. I accompanied a team of 14 technicians. When I say techni technicians, I'm talking about people that actually ran the machine. The labor group, I accompanied them to Japan. I watched the Japanese work and the temperature in Nagoya, Japan. Incidentally, when I talk about the new emerging model of the intuitive model, the fun place to work, the exciting work environment, that came from Japan because back in the 50s, we shared that with them through a man named Dr. Edwards Deming. We don't have time to talk about Edwards Deming, but the whole philosophy of how Japan is operating their manufacturing and working environments is directly result and can be attributed to the work of an American named Dr. Edwards Deming who went there in the 1950s. Now it's coming back to America. This whole model of management is coming back into America. When I was in Japan, I saw this model work. I saw this model work. The temperature in Japan in Nagoya to steel mill was 96 degrees with high humidity. Because we're working in a steel mill each day for 10 days, we had to wear very heavy garments. We had to wear helmets and goggles and towels and leggings. And we went into this working environment each day, and it was absolutely unbearable. And the Japanese were smiling. And I said to the Japanese, why are you smiling? This is miserable. And one Japanese who spoke English says, you're an American. You would find this miserable. We Japanese find it exciting. You see, we're playing a game. It's called the world economy game. And we're winning, flat out winning. We're leagues ahead of everybody else. And I said, why are you smelling under these miserable conditions? And they said, because we're making money. And I said to them, uh, you know, it's very, very strange because these are miserable conditions and I see you smiling. I saw the Japanese in the most unbearable environmental conditions doing what I just shared with you a moment ago, 
patting each other on the back, encouraging each other. I could not tell who the boss was and who the workers were. There was no way to dial one from the other. And that kind of information, that kind of management is what we're going to experience in America. I saw another phenomenon. I got to the work environment each morning about an hour early because Japan is 12 hours out of sync with this. When I arrived at the working environment an hour early, there were several Japanese there already. And I saw them doing something. I saw them doing exercises. And I said to these Japanese, why are you doing exercises? He says, because when we go to work, we're prepared mentally and physically. We're together just like we're playing a game. When we go to work at 8 o'clock, we're ready to go to work. And I thought, gosh, in America, we clock in and go get coffee. We warm up on company time. I saw them doing something else. I never saw them looking for lunch. When the lunch whistle blew and they had a chime, incidentally in Japan, they don't have whistles or bells. They have chimes, a nice melodious chime. And a melodious chime would sound, and all of a sudden, people would quit working and send to have their lunch. I thought, in America, I observed, people will say, gosh, it's almost lunchtime. Don't want to start anything big. I'll catch that after lunch. We have another phenomenon in America. It's called almost quitting time. Golly, it's almost quitting time. I might as well leave that for tomorrow. And I watched the Japanese in America. We're going to follow it. A very, very different. But what, what, you're, what you're going to see why do the Japanese, why do the Japanese work like that? Incidentally, I saw the Japanese doing something else. I saw the Japanese working an hour extra each night on their own time. When the whistle blew or the little chime, they didn't run out of there like, good, we're away from this terrible place. They walked very slowly into training rooms. The building I worked in was a huge training facility in the center of the Nippon Steel Complex. Every Japanese worker went in there their own time. And what do you suppose they did? They reviewed the day's productivity. They had charts and diagrams, and they reviewed and said, how can we do better tomorrow? And they showed up each day an hour early. And what I saw, the Japanese wanted to win. And I saw an incredible attitude towards each other. And that's the model we're trying to adapt to America. That's the model we're pulling back into America. And it's going to be very difficult because it's very difficult to change. And yet we're finding, and I want to assure you graduates, this is not a casual thing that's going to take 20 or 30 years in America. In our state alone, we have changed 275 major firms in our state in just five years. And if you don't know the implications of what I'm sharing with you, all the major auto companies and many other like Caterpillar Tractor are insisting that anybody that produces a part or a product for them, and I'll give you this, an idea of the size, the complexity of the problem. In the state of Ohio, there are 2,000 manufacturing firms that produce parts, parts just, for, just for the Ford Motor Company. There are over 1,500 that produce parts for the General Motors Corporation. Just for those two corporations alone, General Motors and Ford are insisting that those 3,500 firms come together and implement some kind of system where workers are made to feel happy about themselves. They're not saying, we hope you do it. They mandate it. And Ford Motor Company will give any firm six months to implement the training program to see that it is exactly moving in that direction. So when I share with you graduates, things are different out there, they will be different. They're going to demand more of you. They're going to demand more of your enthusiasm towards yourself. They're going to demand more of your enthusiasm towards each other. They're going to demand that you, as a person, asset the environment. In other words, when you enter the environment, you're an asset. You add to it your personality and your activities and your happiness is part of the environment you plan to pursue. And it's hard to really realize because if you don't think this is a major shift in America, and this is recent research, Recent research reported management psychology, a national magazine, pointed out that in Japan, 70% of the corporate investment is spent, that's time and or energy, is spent in making people feel good about themselves. In America, our best guesstimate at today's rate, it's 30%. We have 40% to go. And we suspect that within the next five years, you graduates will see that. All I am saying that when you leave here with your technical skills, that's fine, but you're going to have to develop intuitive skills. You're going to have to develop kinmanship skills. You're going to have to develop fellowship skills, collegial skills to make other people feel happy they're around you. And it isn't a casual request. It is a demand and a part of the industry because the best estimate in this America, and I would like to share with you Dr. Edwards Deming in a tape, a videotape that I have, the Deming tapes they're called, the introductory tape, Dr. Deming is talking to a man named Dr. Tiberius. Dr. Tiberius is president of MIT in, in Massachusetts. Dr. Tiberius says to Dr. Deming, Dr. Deming, who spent 30 years in Japan, can we catch the Japanese? And Dr. Deming says in a slightly sarcastic manner, he says, catch the Japanese? Do you think the Japanese will let you catch them? The Japanese are leagues ahead of us. And Dr. Deming says, we may not catch them. 
but at least we can make end runs. There's a lot of industries in America with the right kind of attitude in the part of the worker, the right kind of attitude in the part of labor management working together, the right kind of attitude in the part of people collaborating to somehow make the working environment more healthy in terms of human relations and psychology that we will make severe and, and significant end runs around the Japanese. And many of you in this room, with your technical skills moving in the business environment, many of you in this room may not know that someday you will be tapped for managerial positions. And I think there's information I'd like to share with you. It's called the Cox Report. The Cox Report was just released just about three months ago. In fact, maybe four or five months ago. The Cox Report was a study of the emerging American manager. The Cox Report, they looked at successful companies, and they said, what would you look for in a person if you were going to move them from a technician level, from an operation level, up to a level of management? Now, all of you may not know that being a manager is a very specific thing. Being a manager doesn't mean that you have technical skills only. It means you have skills of working with people. You have skills of understanding people. And the Cox Report clearly said in this most, almost damaging, I would say, almost damaging report saying, what are we looking for to move people from technical positions into positions of management, into positions of authority and or leadership? And here's what the Cox Report says. The Cox Report clearly says that a person being considered for management must be good looking. Good looking doesn't mean attractive like you'd see in a TV show. Good looking means you're well groomed, you appear to have charm, and that's the other thing they want. They want a person that's charming. The word charm I want you to remember. Charm and another word they use, they want somebody that has a little bit of a charisma. Charisma is simply meaning when you're in the environment of others, you make them feel pleased with themselves. And when I said to you, get inspired with yourself each day, that's the kind of person that has the capacity to have somebody else inspired with themselves. Your inspiration with yourself is directly related to how high you can cause other people to be inspired with themselves. Now, if you've never experienced it, many of you in this room can experience and relate to me. How many of you have ever been around depressing people? And I don't have to share with you what they do to you. They depress you. How many of you have been around exciting people? Like my friends in Japan. And incidentally, I didn't finish that story in Japan. I didn't finish that story because I brought, I came back with that working team into Wheeling Pittsburgh Steel, an American plant, and I saw the same kind of enthusiasm transplanted into our plant in the state of Ohio. And I want you to know that caster just began running in January, and I want you to know because of that enthusiasm and that in technology and that feeling of togetherness and wanting to work together, I want you to know that steel plant cannot fill its orders. You need to know that. So it does work, and I was empirically involved right at the gut level of that particular activity. The Cox Report also said, and I hope you will take this in the information, if you are a cigarette smoker or a pipe smoker or a cigar smoker, do not apply. They're saying smoking is now out. And lucky being in Utah, that's probably not in anyhow, is it? <laughs> so you folks are right at the delivery level. Now this one, I hope this doesn't offend you, but this is a Cox Report, not my statement. I'm just sharing what the Cox Report found out they're looking for. They're saying if you are 15 percent, uh, excuse me, 15 pounds overweight, that will cause a 44 percent rejection rate. If you are 50 pounds overweight, that will cause a 66 percent rejection rate. So you know, you folks, a little bit overweight, you got to deal with that too. And uh, the other thing that may be interesting, they also say that you must be a conservative dresser. You must dress conservatively. You must not dress to achieve recognition with your peers. You're dressing to appear to be conservative. And if you don't know what conservative dress is, I recommend you get the Cox Report because I could talk a lot about it. They also, and the one I disagree with, for males only, a male must be 5'10 or taller. I disagree with that because I'm only 5'7. So certainly that one is wrong. You know? <laughs> But I, I think it's interesting because you young people in this room may not know. You're beginning your careers with technical skills and you're all adults. I promise you the business environment you're about to encounter is different. I promise you what you're about to find out there, if it is not different now, will be different. And I promise you there's excitement in America. I see it, I feel it in America, working directly to the business community. I see a lot of old guard managers in America very frightened by what's happening, but they're giving in. And I don't know if you know what the old gar manager, when I used to be a tool and die maker, my foreman used to chew tobacco and spit on the floor. In today's environment, that foreman would not be a foreman. All I am saying, times are different, things are different. They're looking for the little more well-groomed individual, looking for somebody to cause me to feel good about me. 
because all the research in the world, and I want you to hear this clear, if you feel good about you, if you feel psychologically healthy about you, you'll be an extra good worker. The quality of work is directly related to how you feel about yourself. That isn't a casual statement. That's been researched over and over and over again in productivity studies. Productivity simply means how many parts you produce by the resources invested. And they're saying people who feel better about themselves for some reason produce better parts and produce not only better parts, but certainly more parts. And I suppose one area I can promise you, we worked with one plant in Ohio where we had a severe labor management difficulty. And implying, in, excuse me, implanting a employee participant group activity where the employees took part in management. And I think that's a major message to young people in this, these young adults in this room. You will be, have to be part of management. It is no longer free for you just to work. Employee participant groups mean you actively engage in managerial activities. People do not make unilateral decisions on their own. They now depend on employees to help take those decisions. You will have to make those decisions. That's part of your responsibility. We found in a plant with severe management labor difficulties by simply putting in a good employee participant group package activity to do the things I just suggested, that plant is not only productive, it happens to be a General Motors plant, it has the best quality control record of all GM plants in the entire world, and that's been going on for three solid years. So things are different out there. Things are exciting out there. And I suspect with the enthusiasm of the young people and the young adults in this audience, take that enthusiasm I see here this evening. Take that enthusiasm and take it to the workplace, and I think you'll find that you'll be an accepted quantity and quality for the future of this country. And I'm very proud of you. And incidentally, for many of you who do not know, when the president mentioned I worked with a 40,000-member youth organization in the state of Ohio, that youth organization was VICA, Vocational Industrial Clubs of America. I was very proud of the work I did with that youth organization, and the reason being, and I guess everything really kind of fits, because I felt the student vocational organizations, not only VICA, but the others, do something aside from the skill development. They develop the character of the individual, and the character of the individual is the dimension that now the American industry business community is looking for, for a person to be a highly productive member of the continued economic growth of our country. You've been to a delightful audience. My congratulations to all you young people and young adults who are graduating. My congratulations to you. Mothers, fathers, brothers, sisters, aunts, uncles, and cousins and friends that have stood by these young adults while they went through their two-year trauma or three-year trauma of receiving an associate's degree. I'm proud of them, and I feel as good about them as you do. Thank you very much.
I have the very unique pleasure each year to participate in that part of the program which for you, I'm sure, is the highlight of the program, that of presenting the graduates for their awards. It's an interesting phenomenon to watch this take place each year, particularly as we go through the last week of testing and evaluation, as you begin to watch the students uh, uh, walk a little more bleary-eyed from building to building, and uh, even some of the faculty walking more bleary-eyed from building to building, as they're preparing and, and giving tests. Uh, people mumbling back and forth. I heard a group of students the other day in front of one building arguing whether question number 18 meant this and whether it was answer A or B, and there was a very heated discussion going. I got excited enough I almost wanted to ask who the teacher was so I could go find out what the answer was. But this is a culmination for you of a lot of long, hard effort. I understand there are those of you out here tonight that have been going to school at night part-time for six or seven years to finally culminate in the achievement you've made. And we're honored to be able to have participated in that success. I hope as you receive these awards tonight, each of you graduates will remember that as you perhaps sat bleary-eyed studying at home, there were wives and husbands and parents who may be tiptoeing around to, uh, and children uh, to, to make sure that you could study and prepare yourselves in the way you have, and that you'll remember them and give credit to them too because I'm sure without their help and support, you would not be here this evening. And then I'd just like to indicate to you one other item. You know, for us, your success only begins tonight. It does not culminate tonight. Yes, you've, we feel a certain degree of excitement that you've made it through the classes. <laughs> but to us, the real success now is where you go and what you do from here on. So remembering that, would you please take the time from time to time to stop into the campus and talk to your instructors and let them know what you've done and what you're doing. As an instructor, I can think of no greater compliment than to have a former student come back and say, hey, you know what I'm doing now and thanks for the help that you provided to get me started. So we from the faculty and staff would ask that you remember us as you go through your sojourn and keep in touch so that we can enjoy with you your successes. It is just a beginning. Many of you will be involved in apprenticeship kinds of programs or continued schooling or company schooling. You've heard today that you'll probably be retraining at least three times before you get through your work career. And I, as I heard uh, Dr. Digert say that we've got to keep ourselves in physical fitness, we can't be overweight. I tried to sit a little taller, and, and uh, you've got to be a little, suck in my stomach a little further. I'm sitting next to my boss, and I, I don't want to have that uh, the problem. So we wish you the very best of success now, for it truly is a beginning. And if you attack your jobs, future jobs, and future schooling, the way you have here at Utah Technical College, we know you'll be a success. Now, President Carnahan, it is a distinct honor and pleasure for me, on behalf of the faculty and instructional staff, to present these students to you as having met all of the requirements for the certificates, the degrees, and the diplomas in the various disciplines, and I present them to you to receive those awards. Thank you. Thank you. Students, would you please stand? You have fulfilled all of the requirements for your degree or certificate and have been recommended by the college faculty to graduate. By virtue of the authority vested in the Board of Regents and the Institutional Council and delegated to me, 
I confer upon you your degree or certificate. The diplomas will now be presented. Will you please be seated until you're called to receive your degrees? Thank you very much. We are not through just yet. Will the graduates please arise? As graduates now, you may take the tassel on the cap and move it from the left to the right. Let's give them a hand. Congratulations. Please be seated. Our Heavenly Father, as we pause at the ending of these ceremonies, we give thanks for all we have and all that we have received. And we express appreciation to all of who have helped us to reach this point in lives. We now ask for wisdom in using the knowledge we have gained as we go forth to serve and ask a benediction on this ceremony. In the name of Jesus Christ, amen.